Welcome to Birken Forest Monastery's live stream. I'm Ajahn. There are times when I feel lonely practicing Buddhism. How can I overcome this loneliness? <clears throat> well, that is a side effect, uh, especially at the beginning of uh, uh, if you're serious about the path and <clears throat> want to uh, <clears throat> cultivate the path. There is a lot of inner work to be done, and nobody can go with you in that inner world. <clears throat> Psychologically, though, and especially in uh, in the West, the what is called the Sangha is not so obvious and apparent. In Asia, in the Buddhist countries, you you can't turn around without seeing a Buddha image, or monks walking in the streets in the morning, so forth. Uh, monasteries everywhere, symbols everywhere. You feel very immersed <clears throat> in a community as, as in a, a Catholic would in, in Rome. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we're importing this uh, vision of reality, Buddhism, into the West and unless you attend a temple or a, have a community, then you will feel somewhat isolated. Uh, there are, though, many temples around now. And <clears throat> usually when we say temple, we're just borrowing an English word. Uh, Vihara is the, uh, the Pali word, <clears throat> how they're referred to, or in uh, Thailand, a wat. W A T. Uh, so <clears throat> those are places of kind of devotion. Uh, there's not a lot of meditation going on in, in those places. It, it just has a whole ambience and uh, uplifting feeling, very serene and lots of candles and incense. And most of the population would uh, visit those places, but not necessarily to meditate. Uh, well, it, it is a form of meditation. It's kind of just uplifting and so forth, but there's lots of activities going on and sounds and so forth. And then there's the meditation pro uh, process, which is needs silence and um, is redu reduced in terms of activity. And that, of course, is actually best done alone, but it's hard to do alone. So <clears throat> you need... Um, other people attending a retreat and so forth. And that's why we shape the, what's called the modern idea of uh, meditation retreats. By the way, um, when you look at the original teachings of the Buddha in the Pali Canon, you do not find any uh, retreats for lay people. What you find is uh, an encouragement to visit a Buddhist monastery of Vihara on the full moon and the new moon, they're on a lunar calendar. So in the West, we tend to be on a solar calendar. So Sundays, by the way, so we, this is why we do our live stream on Sundays. We're, we're adapting to the Western calendar, a legacy of Christianity, perhaps. <clears throat> um, but you can't find there are any like extended retreats where lay people come and move into the monastery for 10 days or something like that or into a retreat center. They would just come and spend up to a day and a night at, at a monastery once every week or two. So if you can visit, I mean, now here, why this is why we're doing these live streams is that you, you have a sense of community. You can see people all over the world joining this. They're in Tennessee and they're in South Africa and they're in Uzbekistan and <laughs> India and Norway, all this kind of... So um, this is what we can offer. Uh, and because of the miracle of this kind of new technology, we can make it available and support system for people all over the world, and we're answering their questions. You get to feel that you're part of a group. We also set up a Upasaka group, 
Upasaka means uh, one who comes close to the to the monastics, uh, who are devoted lay people who practice, educate themselves in the teachings of the Buddha and practice meditation and uh, aspects of the Eightfold Path. And uh, we train them in a specific method uh, over a period of a year at least, and then they can get together without being in disharmony. So those are some options for human contact and support for that process. But if you do it, you know, in this in alienated, we just pick it up, you read a book on meditation, start trying to meditate or listen to Dhamma talks, you might feel alone, but uh, this is what the Sangha is for. There's definitely, the Buddha recognizes community can be very, very helpful to, to many people. So that's how you uh, would deal with your loneliness. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Next question is from the live chat from Stella in Texas, United States. And it's on a similar theme. After being betrayed by someone I trusted, I became reluctant to go out with people. I am living almost in isolation. I feel this is better than being hurt. What should I do about relationships? Well, you, you need to be careful about relationships. Uh, the Buddha, the first blessing of life, uh, in, this is something called the Mangala Sutta, the <clears throat> Sutta on Great Blessings. So it's it's great advice for ordinary people in life, and that the first blessing is to not to associate with the foolish. And who are the foolish? <coughs> <coughs> Primarily, <coughs> those who are immoral. And what is the definition of morality? It's the staying within the bounds of the five precepts. <clears throat> one is not a killer of other conscious living beings. One does not is not a thief, a sexual... Um, avoid sexual misconduct. <clears throat> and that, that usually is some sort of definition of uh, sexual acts which are harmful to others. Uh is not a liar and then is not uh, dependent on intoxicants, <clears throat> does not indulge in, in intoxicants. So many people, uh, it's, you've just narrowed down the population to about 10%. <laughs> <clears throat> Lots of people are ca very casual liars. Uh, they th There are four aspects of right speech, you know, lying, uh, harsh speech, malicious speech, and uh, frivolous speech. <clears throat> and this is very common these days that people don't even feel that these are inappropriate. Uh, so you have something to judge a person by. It's not just chemistry. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, you know, I, they feel dangerous or something. You know, I feel that's exciting. And <laughs> please... <laughs> If you want to, if you want to be betrayed, just take up with somebody who's just you got chemistry with, but you haven't examined their moral basis. And you know, maybe somebody with a moral framework, uh, a moral compass, may not be all that exciting um, in terms of the chemistry. But you have to make mm -hmm. choices here. Are, are you into? Is this is a kind of idea that is not common in all societies that you you get together in relationships because of chemistry <clears throat> it's uh it's quite often you get together to have kids have a family and it's not <clears throat> based on much except uh the stability of character or something like this people are looking for excitement in these uh relationships as well, which is maybe not the best uh, idea. Because when the excitement diminishes, then what, you know? So this is a, a reframing of what, what you're looking for in relationships. And that uh, it's best to be on the same, with the same vision in life. So 
if you both happen to be committed to uh, Theravada Buddhism mm -hmm. or something like this, then it, a lot of the difficulties are ironed out. <clears throat> but it's a lot. It's a each person has to also journey on the path individually. So that is the advice of the Buddha. So avoid the foolish, that is the immoral, and with wrong views. And then the next blessing is to associate with the wise, who are people with, with a moral sense and have a vision of life. And that will be a blessing to you, and especially in uh, close relationships. Yeah. Okay, next question. Next question is from a Georgian in Asia. I have access to Dhamma and other resources which have been a blessing. Some of my close relatives, old and young, are unnecessarily suffering with limiting beliefs, wasting vast opportunities on little pleasures instead of seeking those that can lead to lasting joy in each moment. How can I get them to see that if we are not fearful for whatever we have at hand now, then it too will be lost? I feel sad and mad. I am worried they may unintentionally hurt and sabotage others under this dim light of living. How can I help? Well, first you can help yourself by not being sad and mad. <laughs> uh, the Buddha never advised anybody to be sad and mad about the fact that infinite uh, ignorance is almost infinite. As Einstein said, ignorance is it's not certain whether the universe is infinite, but it's pretty obvious that ignorance is. So you're not, you're, it's not appropriate for the Buddha to assign you to fix everybody. Uh, we don't do that. We realize that it's an impossible task, that people either hear the Dhamma and are inspired by it or not, but you don't really have time to... Uh, penetrate that impenetrable barrier in people's minds. So it's a different approach. I mean, the whole Western culture is, uh, they are proselytizers. And if you don't know what that word is, look it up. <laughs> Means that people who knock on their door and say, have you heard the good news? Um, they are, <clears throat> the whole of uh, Christianity is, is evangelical and, and you know, spreading the good news and all that kind of stuff. So it's even even you see these political movements like that are abandoning Christianity, Marxism, and so forth, and they're evangelicals as well. <laughs> they all got infected by feeling a need to to straighten everybody out. <clears throat> um, Buddhism is realizes that, and, and people who are coming to the Dhamma realize that that it was fortunate that they listened or they, they, they read with interest about this and it, it made a difference in their lives. Um, but often one is naive about the fact that it's not so easy to communicate this to others or enthuse, produce enthusiasm in others. It's a strange um, attitude in terms of if you have worldly values that you're your, your interest is in sights and sounds and smells and tastes and touches and various <laughs> kinds of ideas. <clears throat> These are, this is the value of the, of the ordinary world. And Dhamma, the teachings of the Buddha, is going sharply against this into an unworldly type of value structure. And quite often people just simply fail to, to uh, grasp what that is and how, how that could be anything but a, a deprivation. <laughs> so uh, harbor your your enthusiasm uh, and make sure that you don't just waste your your personal energies and time on you know, fruitless uh, attempts to communicate. Uh, if people want to know, then just recommend it to recommend that they find out and just have some good sources, a, a book or a website or Ajahn Sona's live stream. <laughs> and uh, just say, yeah, if you're interested in it, there it is. Um, and 
start to feel at ease with this, uh, not frustrated, angry, or sad about this. In the midst of this world of tragedies, we are well. Uh, in, in, mis- in the midst of this vast sorrowing crowd, we are healthy and well. And it's important that we, we don't just fall, but through empath- empathy, fall into sorrow with the sorrowing crowd. It's important that somebody is well, happy, and peaceful. Otherwise, there's no hope whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And the vast majority are not well, happy, and peaceful. So we pursue this, and there, there is no way to just give it to somebody. You, you, you simply have to develop it yourself, and it's quite a, an arduous journey to this, uh, uh, to understand the attitude which allows you to be well, happy, and peaceful in the midst of this uh, suffering and sorrowful world. But that is the, the path. Okay, well, let's go to the next question. Next question is from the live chat from Nadia in France. Dear Ajahn, what is the best way to practice right speech in a work or office environment without being dragged into office gossip? Yeah, it's very difficult. But I think if you <clears throat> commit yourself to right speech, and uh, it's best done, uh, you know, just even five minutes in the morning, just a little reflection before you head off to work, about what you're, where you're willing to go with with speech and where you're not willing to go, and eventually people get to they they just realize okay she didn't laugh at that bad joke you know uh, she didn't uh, participate in that racist uh, diatribe or this uh, this angry rant um, so she's not into it. <laughs> Uh, or he's not into it. So they start to uh, they they start to look for other people who share their sense of speech, you know, of wrong speech. <laughs> and uh, they just they they start to be a little more careful around you because it's awkward and uncomfortable. So, but you have to be willing to uh, not go along with people. And uh, that's that's all there is to it. That's what happens as you develop on the path is that you start to become less sociable. <laughs> you avoid social situations because they're so the 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 general quality of them is quite often low. People take intoxicants and they bad behavior. Uh, etc. And you just don't want to be around it anymore. So there's, quite often you start withdrawing from many social situations, but you still have to go to work. And then in, the, in work, they, people would like to, you to participate in their vision of reality. And, uh, but you, this is your nature. You say, I have a dhamma, a, a vision of reality, and uh, it's not up for a compromise just so, uh, so you can feel better. I'm going to disappoint you sometimes in not agreeing to participate in those those kinds of speech. Okay. Next question is from the live chat from Mudita in Alberta. Dear Ajahn, after having a TIA, I'm aware that the body will go, but what happens if my beautiful mind goes? Then what? Well, we have to realize that all through our life, our mind is going. And uh, the, the mind of, our, mm-hmm. of a child, like when the, the three-year-old's mind went, and then it was replaced by a four-year-old's mind and a five-year-old's mind, a six-year-old mind. There's a very drastic uh, change mm-hmm. somewhere, I don't know, maybe at 12 or something, uh, where a certain amount of magical investment in the world, a kind of immerse, uh, merging into the world, uh, being swallowed by the, the magic experience of life, starts to dry up and your, your prefrontal cortex starts to impose systems and logic on the world. Childhood passes and then there's this period of a strange new period where 
it's not just magic anymore. There's sort of, it, it becomes symbolic. The world becomes symbolic. Quite often it's a, a feeling of loss. Um, uh, and then uh, people look for some sort of way to get through that. Uh, they find <clears throat> ways to get through that. But our mind is changing all the time and and mental states are being lost all the time. And of course, as we get older, our memory starts to decline and all of these things, uh, that's, that's what the Buddha is talking about. So we're in this endlessly changing, sometimes diminishing and sometimes increasing in uh, capacities. Uh, this is the nature of life. Uh, we, the center of it, the consciousness is not really being destroyed in any way. Uh, the, the understanding, Buddhists, Buddhists' understanding of consciousness is that much of what we have done and accomplished and so forth can be carried on and will be of benefit to us in the future. You know, we go to sleep and in, in dreamless sleep, you know, where do we go? We, everything, something, ha you know, apparently time passed and we weren't there. And then we start to reassemble in the morning and by the way, uh, welcome to uh, Daylight Saving Time. Um, uh, I hope you're reassembling yourself an hour early. <laughs> um, we, we reassemble ourselves and um, uh, take up where we l left off, but some things are left behind and some things, new things will be picked up. So all we have to remember is not, not specifics of of how we do things, but the, mm -hmm. our general attitude. And that general attitude is sort of, if we practiced enough, it is baked into our, our system and will persist. Even in uh, significant Alzheimer's, um, you can see that the fundamental personality is still there. If uh, Alzheimer's, you, you find yourself not, not understanding where you are, if you feel lost, etc., And, um, you don't know who who you're talking to, even though that might be your 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 own ch children are, are talking to you, and you don't recognize them. Some people panic, some people are afraid, some people are are frustrated by this, and others are not. Uh, and so, what the the Buddhist idea is that you know, uh, in sometimes you are uh, forced into different situations where. You, you don't know where you are and uh, you, you don't recognize everybody, etc. New situations. How are you when those transitions take place? Uh, you can be, uh, bring a sense of ease and peace to that if you've trained it into your system. So it's, it, it is good for all of us to train ourselves to be at ease in, in all kinds of new and difficult and uh, demanding situations. And this is what happens with the TIA, this transient ischemic something or other. It's a little stroke, yeah. And, and many of us, are, you can have that at any age, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's less common in, in early age, but even children have these strokes and, uh, and brain injuries and so forth are common. It's quite amazing the changes that happen when, when the brain is uh, affected. But in the midst of all this, uh, fundamental attitudes can remain the same. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go on to the next question. Next question from the live chat is from Marquis in Boston, Massachusetts, United States. Dear Ajahn Sona, will you please elaborate on the skillful Buddhist perspective to the polarizing topic of abortion? There are three aspects to my question. How does abortion relate to the first precept, i.e., is it destroying life at any stage of pregnancy? Two, how should we think of the ethical counter-argument that it is the lesser evil? Three, how do you recommend engaging or do you recommend engaging with strongly pro-choice, with those strongly pro-choice on this topic, particularly when they are close family members? Yeah, this is quite a, a hot topic uh, 
D during my lifetime, uh, you know, attitudes about this have changed. Uh, uh, it was, uh, abortion was thoroughly illegal in uh, U the U.S. and Canada for when I was young. And uh, and then, I don't know, in 1970, at least in Canada, the, sort of the, they started to mm -hmm. permit uh, access to abortion. <clears throat> and then, then it became just anybody wants one uh, before a certain stage. Yeah, uh, uh, it depends on your attitude to consciousness. So here's the Buddhist... Uh, by the way, this was dealt with very, very specifically and in great detail mm -hmm. by the Buddha during the lifetime of the Buddha, and especially for monks. Now, this is the ad advice, uh, not the advice, but the rules for monks. Monks uh, cannot recommend abortion. Um, uh, they cannot give advice about how to produce an abortion or recommend an abortion. And they also cannot give advice or recommend euthanasia, uh, putting people so-called out of their misery. So there are two things that monks would be disrobed for, um, uh, advising somebody to have an abortion or giving them a method for that and then that person carrying it out or uh, advising somebody who is, wants to die um, how, how to make that happen or advising maybe their relatives how to, how to carry that out. And, and if they do carry it out, then that monk is now guilty of, uh, of, ki of killing a, a living being, uh, of uh, being part of killing a living being, so uh, a human. And then they would be disrobed for that. They, they cannot, and they cannot ever be a monk again in this life. So that's pretty severe. <laughs> it's very, very clear. Any, um, any monk who kills a human at any stage of, uh, of human life, from conception to the end of life, is, uh, is disrobed, is, can no longer be a monk. So monks are very, very careful about this I issue. Um, now that, that because, you know, if, if monks start giving advice like this, uh, they might decide, you know, this, it can be all over the map. You know, it, you can see the, the results. If, if this is not simply not available, uh, to can even consider for, for monks. Um, so the, the Buddhist idea is at birth is a fa has got three factors to it. Uh, the sperm and egg of the the couple, the the parents, have to join, and then uh, so in modern times we think, well, that's all there is to a being, uh, the material aspect, and then consciousness develops. But Buddhism doesn't see it that way. There's there's a lot of talk about what consciousness is. There's a whole group, philosophical schools. What is consciousness? Buddhism has regards consciousness as a kind of a, a process which uh, uh, participates in this joining of the sperm and egg. It's not merely biological. It's it's something that is the third factor. Sperm egg and the uh, arrival of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So consciousness arrives uh, in this matrix of uh, sperm and egg. And that consciousness is then regarded as uh, mm -hmm. the conscious embryo is, 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 is a being. And one should not uh, kill it, one should regard it as alive. So this is now who know, and this is discussed very in great detail in the what is called the Abhidhamma, like the technical uh, teachings. Uh, when does the consciousness arrive? Does it arrive instantly when sperm and egg join? Is 
does consciousness that like somebody somebody's consciousness from a previous life arrive at that moment is it simultaneously instantaneous or sometime after sperm and egg have joined together in their development does consciousness join that it's a matter of discussion uh, when that happens but that's what is considered a, a living being when consciousness participates. You can see that uh, obviously biological processes take place, but if there's no consciousness, that usually there's spontaneous uh, uh, interruption of the pregnancy process. People have spontaneous... They're not really spontaneous abortions. There, there may not be consciousness uh, involved. People object to say that <clears throat> while well, the thing is so tiny or lacks features of humans and so forth, that is uh, not considered uh, pertinent. Uh, uh, the size of a being is not, you know, obviously if, if a being is one foot tall, it's not of any less value than one that's six feet tall. <laughs> so it's not being. Um, the brain development is the big issue in uh, modern times, uh, how can uh, there be consciousness if there's no brain development and the heart develops before the brain. <clears throat> brain is, is a later stage of the embryo development. And, uh, but from a Buddhist point of view, uh, that is not uh, identical with consciousness. Yeah, so that we're, at, we're at complete odds with materialist ideas of, of consciousness if that consciousness is nothing else than the brain. <clears throat> that the mind is nothing more than the material aspect of the brain. That, that is not the Buddhist view of things. Consciousness is participates with the body, has a relationship to the body, requires the body, but is not identical with the physical uh, body or the brain. Is not identical with it. So they're, we would say, a dualist. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so that's the attitude <clears throat> but as far as uh, encountering hostility with relatives who who want easy access to abortion um, or, pro, or pro-choice uh, well I from a Buddhist point of view we're not telling people what to do we're just saying what what the Buddha would choose you know, not choose not to uh, uh, advocate an abortion and, and monks are also not to advocate for abortion <clears throat> but what about in the case of where where the mother's life is at risk in that case we might say that you, if you could save one uh, that you should save one but it's not, the intention there is not to kill kill one, to save one. It is to save one. <clears throat> and it means that sometimes the, the, uh, the being, one, one being must be removed. And it's kind of like separating identical twins. You know, if, if there's, a, there's a threat to the life of both of them, then they would take a chance to separate them. But they're not interested in killing one of them. <laughs> they're, in, they're interested in saving one of them. <clears throat> so that's the case of where it is a clear um, threat to both lives. If the mother dies, the fetus dies as well. And uh, Whereas if it's possible to save one, then the, uh, the, the uh, activities are towards the saving of the mother, not towards the destruction of the child, but towards the saving of the mother. The side effect is that the, the, the embryo might die, but it's not, that's not the intent. So that might be a consideration in these matters. But many, you know, in the great percentage of abortions are, are simply matters of it's inconvenient to be pregnant at this time. You don't want a child. 
in those cases, then uh, the, the the clear intent is to is to make life convenient. But in, in order to do that, you have to uh, destroy the life of the embryo. This is um, <clears throat> this becomes uh, almost a casual uh, event, and of, co- of course, there's explanatory. You know, there's a- advocacies that this this thing is is just a collection of cells, etc. That this is that's from a materialist uh, point of view. It is not shared by everybody, uh, etc. Uh, <clears throat> the But we're not, you know, Buddhism te- tends to be not marching in the streets about this. Uh, it just is quietly explaining our, our attitude about life and uh, that there's negative consequences to, to terminating life of any kind, uh, including animal life. Uh, there's negative consequences to being oblivious to the uh, consciousness of other beings and to terminating their, their lives. So we just say it's it's your karma, you know. It, it it's your decision, and because um, we can't we can't uh, force this issue. And Buddhism is not uh, very interesting. Like <clears throat> there are religions, uh, Islam and Christianity, sometimes which in, who seek to uh, become the structure of the government as well. Especially Islam, uh, they they want to actually have the secular. They want to run the the country through Islamic principles. <clears throat> uh, Christianity has done this through history as well. Um, Judaism does this to to some degree. Uh, Brahmanism does this to some degree. They want to run the country. <clears throat> Buddhism is not trying to take over the country and enforce. Uh, it's dhamma on everybody. If it, it makes it available to people, but uh, we're we're not seeking to uh, determine the laws of the land. We we give advice. We say, here's our view of of this. Uh, be careful. Um, in the West, uh, also, of course. Uh, because of Christianity, uh, animal life is not considered uh, of great concern. Uh, but in Buddhism, animal life is is of great concern. It is do not kill them. <laughs> uh, so you can see, uh, Buddhism has a very high regard for life at all stages, and in all forms, including the animal form. <clears throat> And the embryonic form, and and also, it's just to avoid the formulation of the intent to kill, and then to carry it out. Uh, not a good idea for your own karmic stream, your own ethical. Uh, the consequences will come back to you in, in, if you if you do these things. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go on. That's, that's, a, that's a, a lightning bolt kind of uh, topic, but we're happy to uh, explain the, the Buddhist view. Next question is from Upasika Monica from Regina, Saskatoon, Canada. Regarding accumulation of merits, cur- currently serving my 89-year-old mother who had a difficult life, she is saddened as she knows her life is coming closer to the end how to serve her by sharing the Dhamma. She is a Christian, and any guidance would be greatly appreciated. Well, you, you know, you, <clears throat> you support them and uh, primarily encourage the daughter. Is it daughter? Yeah. Mother. Mother. No, yeah, but she's she is daughter. the daughter. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So she's your mother, and you, what you want to do is, okay. is talk about all of the things that she did for you and that, that you saw her do for others as well. And that, you know, every day that she uh, said, hi, dear, how are you? Or are you doing okay? Or here's breakfast, dear. <laughs> All of the things she did for you. Uh, you'd remind her of that and that that was beautiful. That was good. 
that was wonderful. And, uh, and, uh, and encourage her, make sure she is not dwelling in remorse over things she didn't do or mistakes she made. It just doesn't help. Um, from a karmic point of view, we want to focus the consciousness on, on positive feelings, uplifting feelings, and not fall into preoccupation with some, you know, people, people do some little thing, negative thing, and then they, they, they dwell on it for the rest of their lives because they have a, a kind of a sensitive conscience, but they shouldn't. We all make mistakes. We all do bad things. It's not profitable to dwell on those things. But it is profitable and good to go over our good deeds in life and to remember them and to uh, enjoy them again and again because uh, it, it increases the, the merit of that. So you encourage them to just focus on those good memories, those good acts, and tell them that they did well and so forth. And that, that is, that's their, um, their treasure uh, which go, those are, your good deeds are the friends that go ahead to greet you on the other side. <laughs> she will be greeted by her good deeds, yeah. Next question is from the live chat from Malachi in San Antonio, Texas, United States. Dear Ajahn, do you have any advice on ways to fight guilt when falling short of the f first five precepts? I notice that I'm still very hard on myself, probably stemming from Catholic roots of original sin. With, uh, with a name like Malachi, I suppose, you know, it's, uh, yeah, that's Catholic, very, <laughs> is that Irish Catholic? <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, uh, it's not guilt. Uh, strangely, yeah, Buddhism doesn't advocate guilt. Uh, it advocates that that, that the guilt itself is a kind of another sin. <laughs> it's a, it's a, negative, a negative feeling about the past, but if you had known better, you would not have done it. And you apparently, we, 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 we do things, this is something Socrates has say, said, that, you know, people don't just, they do things because they don't, they thought it was the right, the thing to do. Uh, and why did they think it? Because they were mistaken about this. So pri the fundamental reason why we do things that are negative is because we are ignorant. And <clears throat> if we knew better, we wouldn't have done it. And you can see that in your life, that you, you recognize that, oh, when you were 15, you did this and that, you thought this way and that way, and then when you're 30, you think, that was stupid, wasn't it? But that was a 15-year-old. And that's why they did it, because they didn't know any better. And that's not you, that's them. So <clears throat> as we feel uh, through our, our, our ways through these five precepts, we realize that, yeah, our past selves have, have done these th stupid things, but that's not us, that's not me today. I wouldn't do that, so why should I burden myself with, with uh, guilt? So guilt is not con not considered um, healthy. What's considered healthy is what's called hiri otapa, or fear, a health, a kind of a wholesome fear for your own well-being and a concern for the opinion of the wise in the present and the future, not not the past. So we're we're highly conscientious about our present behavior and concerned for our well-being in the future. But what is done in the past is gone and does not need to be dwelled on. We can, we're free. Mm, it's amazing. <laughs> you don't even have to go to a priest to get uh, absolved from your sins. I, I, I absolve you right now. <laughs> in fact, I can't, I can't absolve you, but you can. You don't need absolution from anybody else. You, you absolve yourself of the past because it's gone. But you're on high alert for the present and the future that you won't do anything stupid that you would later regret. Why do what you will, what you would regret? Do only what you will not regret. That's all. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> okay, next question. <clears throat> next 
question from the live chat is from Vandana in California, United States. Even with so much rapture and bliss happening regularly in meditation, I still have so much attachment to the sense of self. Some defilements are still showing. Please provide guidance. Yeah, that's, that's the next stage of the spiritual path, and that's the hard one. That, that goes much later in the, in the development. The sense of self, the ego, is, is a higher part of the path. <clears throat> the primitive part, it just uh, not, you know, stopping killing people, <laughs> killing and stealing and so forth, are the, are the, the kind of emotions which produce those kind of graphic uh, actions and speech which step over the line of, of, of decent behavior. That's the first thing to go. So we refine ourselves and reduce our anger and our greed <clears throat> through understanding. And then our behavior increases. And then that supports further serenity and feeling good. Because, you know, if we're... If we act out of rage and greed, and then we do things, then we're, we're, our, our conscience is sullied, and we feel guilty, and we're, we're afraid that people will under, know about us, and all this kind of stuff. But if we manage to restrain that, and we stop doing those things, we feel uplifted. We feel like we haven't done anything negative, you know? Maybe done a, good, a few good deeds, feel good. And that increases our sensitivity to that, and uh, our, our we're less inclined to anger and greed. And those are the first and coarsest of the impediments to our well-being. A sense of ego and so forth is a very refined bit of business. And um, it is quite uh, the case that it is it's subtle and sneaks up on you and is hard to spot. But uh, that, that's the philosophical part. That's uh, when we when we are no longer a, a threat to others as a killer or a thief. Um, now we're in the human realm, and then we got to go from the human realm to the superhuman realm, which is abandoning this conceit and ego business. Now that re that's a much more subtle part of the path, and requires development and meditation and etc but the path uh, that the journey from from being becoming a moral human to becoming a superhuman is is beautiful it's a uh, it's beautiful in the beginning in the middle and in the end so look forward to it look forward to this uh, subtle overcoming of this sense of self and the ego and the uh, vanity and conceit, you know, yeah. Next question from the live chat is from Anne Hell. Dear Ajahn, my husband has urged me to invest our cash savings in stocks to grow our assets instead of having it, quote, sit in the bank doing nothing. We are high earners and have accumulated more than enough for early retirement in our 40s, and I feel no desire to make any investments, but I don't want to, quote, cling to my assets in fear of losing them. Could you advise on a skillful approach to this situation? You're, <clears throat> you're afraid that you're going to lose it in the stock market, is it? Is that, do you think that? What, let's consult with Pia here. <laughs> what is she saying? Um, I'm gathering she has no desire to make any investments but doesn't want to cling to assets in fear of losing them. Oh, so she, she doesn't she doesn't want to be fearful about the money they 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 both have their high earners and she doesn't want to be in fear of losing their money um but she doesn't want to become greedy about it like looking for you know fortune in the stock market <clears throat> is that that's probably the attitude well um i mean the buddha does have quite a bit of advice about economics and and uh, sensible approach to money and a certain portion of your of your money so you divide after you've paid for your living expenses and you know your housing and every, all this kind of stuff 
you might have money left over. So it sounds like you've got money left over. So he says, divide it into four parts. A one part is for investment uh, or business. And then another part is for saving. So instead of just plunking it all into the markets, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to plunk it, some of it into, into a savings, uh, a secure savings, um, or treasury bills or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and then you can use some of it, a portion of it for investment in these companies. That's what the stock market is. You're you're becoming a part of a company mm -hmm. if you invest in Apple and Microsoft and Tesla and all this kind. Of, these are the these are businesses, and then yeah, you're 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 just there's nothing wrong with business, so. Uh, you can invest part of your money there and then part into a savings account of something. Mm -hmm. And then part of it you you use for your own uh, enjoyment. You go on holidays and, mm -hmm. and de redecorate your house and so forth. And then another portion of it is for sharing. Uh, so you, you invite your friends over for dinner and mm -hmm. you uh, maybe in, do an, an endowment of a of a scholarship fund or help somebody with education or uh, donate to a monastery, uh, etc. These are social, the social aspects, social good. These are p karmically very positive, good results from that. Don't get too caught up in, in trying to be a monk while well, you're not a monk. Like a monk has to give his money away uh, you have to give these things away, but it's not recommended for lay people to do this. You know, like lay people have to have money and have to have things. And the Buddha never says, you know, ah, just waltz out the door and give everything away. Um, you see this uh, advocation in, for, for in, in the New Testament with Jesus, give all your money to the poor and, and walk away. <laughs> And everybody's wondering how do you how do you do that? You know, <laughs> you just go on the streets or what? That uh, the the lack of explanation is that this is what monastics are. So you can give your money away to the poor, but then you got to join a monastery because <laughs> otherwise you'll starve to death. <laughs> <clears throat> so there is a way to live outside of the material elements, and that is, but that that requires a monastic uh, envelope for that. Other than that, uh, you just deal wisely with money. And the layperson is not necessarily a commitment to poverty or anything like this. It's a, it's a commitment to wise use of money and realizing it's, that's your job is to support yourself and your, your family. And um, there's nothing wrong with the fact that you, you're able to bring in uh, 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 money and so forth, and then you just use it responsibly. By the way, if you these days, if you don't, if you if you don't invest your money, you just leave it in a checking account or something like this. You're actually losing money every day by because of inflation. So it's not really responsible to not at least stay even with your money. If you don't invest it, you will. It will. It will evaporate on you because of inflation. So you have to somehow make whatever the inflation rate is at least five percent or something. You have to find five percent in order to stay even. You're not. You're not greedy or anything. You're just like, do you really want all your hard-earned money to just evaporate? Because if you don't do anything with it, that's what'll happen. But at least you can find some way to stay even with inflation. Otherwise, just it evaporates. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah there's a lot of really good advice uh, about these attitudes from Buddhist advice. And a lot of people are confused. They, they want to give all their money away and, you know, they get all excited about it. But that's, no, 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 no. The Buddha didn't tell, tell you to do that. If you want to be a monastic, yes, but not otherwise than that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question. Final question today is from the live chat from Eternal Searcher. Good day, Bhante. I read the Buddha said, quote, noted 
in his mind the time for rising, unquote, before sitting to meditate. How do you know the time for rising, and is this preferable to using a timer? Uh, the time, well, usually in the suttas, it's before the Buddha goes to sleep, he makes a determination to rise uh, when he wakes up. And that's a kind of a thing you can do. You know, some people say, oh, I don't even need a, I don't even need an alarm clock. I, I, I decide I'm going to wake up at 6 and I wake up at 5.59 or 6.01. You know, it's amazing. There's, somehow the mind can do this. <clears throat> But if you're a meditator, now this happens in monasteries. Uh, the monks get up awfully early. Uh, some the bell gets, you know, three o'clock in the morning, so they have time to go and meditate. And then, <clears throat> but they don't just continuously meditate. They actually have to, at dawn, they start to go on alms round. So they, the, the one monk rings a bell at, at, at the end of the meditation uh, to tell, okay, now is the time for an activity rather than sitting meditation. Now we shall uh, go on alms round. Or usually what happens is that they, we would uh, then tidy up, sort of put things away, sweep, sweep the meditation hall, get our uh, robes and bowl and all of this kind of stuff together in a very systematic way, very focused, uh, quiet way, and then we would proceed in an orderly fashion through the nearest village to receive alms, alms from people, people delighting in the generosity of being able to feed the monks, uh, offering whatever they wish to, whenever they wish. So this is the, and then there's a time for eating and a time to wash up and so forth. And then there's a time for resting, you know, digesting and so forth. And then there's a time for works, you know, where you have to manage things. Uh, and then there's a time for, for uh, meditation. And of course you have, this is, you have, this is part of the wisdom faculty is to know when the time for meditation is, and when the time for activity is, and when the time for resting is, and when the time for meditation, uh, for, for digesting or things like this, or for social duties where you need to interact with a group of people and you can't just meditate. You have to go and talk to people because it's, the, it's important. There's community as well. So these are all done in a timely fashion. Okay, with that, we will end our Q&A today and we will be back next week as well. <laughs> 